Okay, I make it uh, just after 10 o'clock, one minute past 10. We'll run for 45 minutes maximum, so we'll be finished by 10.45 UK time, 11.45 CET. Uh, maybe a little bit before, but uh, not after. So um, we'll have time for questions discussion. So please do send us your questions, your thoughts, your comments during the webinar. Um, let's get going. So uh, if we move on to the, the next slide, then you can, uh, we haven't got our cameras turned on partly to preserve bandwidth, but you can see myself and my two colleagues, Abhishek and Alex. Hello, Abhishek. Check who can hear you okay? Yep, good morning. I can hear you quite clearly and uh, hopefully you can hear me as well. We can and hello, Alex. Hi, John. Hi, Abhishek. Thanks for having me. All right, thanks for joining. So um, let's move on to the three questions that we're looking at today on the next slide. Um, so the three questions on the left will be looking at what the e-mobility ecosystem is and at Delta EE we quite like our, our two by two frameworks. We've got one to introduce you to you for the e-mobility ecosystem. We'll then look at on this two by two framework how OEMs are positioning themselves and where the different companies are positioned and then we'll explore the question what is the right approach or indeed is there a right approach or what are the different approaches? Um, I find this area absolutely fascinating because we see a collision of the energy industry and the automotive industry and with this collision a lot of disruption, a lot of opportunity and in many ways a battle for the customer. Um, and on the right hand side you can see a question that we've asked customers across Europe. Alex, can you just talk around what this question that we asked is and why why it's relevant for this battle for the customer? Certainly. So I think the key thing to remember is that EV charging products and services are always auxiliary to the electric vehicle product itself. And as a result, we see such an important role that automotive sector plays in accessing EV charging. We in the service have been doing a lot of customer research to understand this. And in a recent survey this year, we asked how are people acquiring their home charge points? And by far the, the most common response was that they were getting their charge point from when they bought the vehicle or with the uh, through the vehicle dealership. They've also responded that it's through a recommendation of the dealership that they chose a particular charge point. And from there, they've gone on to use uh, smart energy uh, um, products and services. So it's a really intrinsic part of the uh, EV charging customer. Thanks, Alex. So this shows that OEMs are potentially very well positioned in this battle for the customer, or at least in the very early days of the electric vehicle market. They're, they're starting from a strong position. Um, one question has just been asked, uh, do we get the slides afterwards? And yes, we uh, will circulate the slides and a recording of the webinar afterwards. So you don't need to frantically be making notes or taking screenshots, you, you will get the slides. Okay, um, so we'll go through the three questions one by one. Um, we'll take questions as we go. So please do ask questions uh, using the questions feature on the GoToWebinar sidebar as we go. Um, okay. Next slide is uh, just very quickly for those of you that don't know Delta EE. We work across Europe and uh, in certain global regions, particularly East Asia, around the energy transition, focusing at the customer end of the value chain. You can see here the different areas that we work in and uh, we focus on subscription research and consulting and also have quite a, a nice podcast that you might want to uh, listen to. So. Part of the reason to show this slide is just so you know who we are, but also I think this collision of automotive and energy, um, what we bring is a lot of perspective and expertise on the how the energy aspect will uh, play out in this collision of automotive and energy. So let's move on to the first question now. What is the e-mobility ecosystem? And Abhishek, you're going to talk us through this uh, two by two that I trailed uh, just a few minutes ago. 
Uh, yes, so the e-mobility ecosystem is everything around the car, and we, we've we've taken the approach of trying to categorize what OEMs are doing across two main two main fields. Uh, one is actually providing infrastructure for charging, which is seen as almost you know the basic necessary application or product or service you need to have alongside the car to sell an electric vehicle, and then some of the more complex things like uh, smart charging and tariffs and stationary storage and integration with renewables. Uh, so there's there's two main areas we've mapped across, and this is how we're going to present it. Uh, so we've got charging infrastructure down the bottom and energy services uh, um, vertical. Um, so under charging infrastructure, there's there's two there's two ways to to do it. You're you're trying to provide a domestic and a public or outdoor solution for charging. Facilitating them, what we mean by facilitate is uh, either having the right relationships or partners uh, in each market to provide alongside the vehicle or recommend to your customer. Uh, but you don't make them yourself, you don't control them, but you've got the right partners for it. Uh, fulfilling, on the other hand, is where you make them yourself. You've invested in public charging infrastructure. You've um, invested in producing products that fit better with your vehicle and your brand. Um, and that's what we mean by charging infrastructure. And the, and, the, and the more investment you make, the further along the right you are. Uh, in terms of energy services, um, at the bare bottom is focusing pr primarily on vehicle production, which uh, which some some of the OEMs are uh, from an energy services perspective today. Uh, but again, uh, it's because they're at the start of their journey. Uh, and it gets more complex and more feature rich as we go up in the y axis, uh, which is looking at providing energy tariffs and then bundling and optimization solutions. So, we've, af after doing our analysis on what all of the major European o OEM groups were doing and OEMs present in Europe, uh, we realized there were, you know, three, three approaches. Uh, or rather two approaches and one which is to be revealed uh, one is in house so a lot of the investment is coming from the oem directly uh, it's their own brand they're controlling it they're spending the time money and effort today uh, to make it to make it more of an accessory to the vehicle uh, just as they would for everything else uh, and the other approach is joint venture, venture and partnerships which is another approach which works better for some oems which are either earlier in their journey of electrification or um, it gives them flexibility. And that gave us three distinct groups of OEMs. And there's a reason why you can't see logos here because we'll get to that in a second. You're uh, just teasing people. I'm a check at the moment, aren't you? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I, I like doing that. Uh, so, so we've got the leaders uh, at the top who are you know, looking at optimization. Uh, they've invested in public charging infrastructure they've invested in domestic infrastructure they're giving you if you are an electrification sorry if you're an e-mobility customer or an electric vehicle customer uh, they want to give you all the choices that you might want themselves you've then got the the challengers um, and there are there are a fair few in this category who are uh, quite prominent in what they're doing uh, and then you've got the fast followers who are either early in their um, journey of um, you know, electrification and e-mobility uh, or are taking a more, let's say, a measured approach based on their own strategy and it works for them. Uh, so we'll go into exactly who's doing what um, shortly, but uh, this, yeah. is, this is the methodology we've used to uh, get to that stage. So, Thanks, um, Amishek. And I've probably mistrailed it and it's not quite a two by two, it's a, a two by three if you want to be pedantic, yeah. but you, you yeah, get the idea. Yeah. Um, so that's how we frame the uh, the ecosystem. Now let's move on to what OEMs are, are doing. Um, Abhishek, you're going to sort of fill in some of those circles with logos. Yes, but not just yet. First, I'm going to show you a very uh, <laughs> a table because you know, everyone likes a table. Um, so. We've, we've gone into more detail here with you know which OEM is doing what in which space uh, and what they're doing in terms of uh, domestic public and solutions and advanced energy services so this is the categorization we've used uh, you'll notice that domestic and public charge points is represented on the x-axis in our previous image and domestic energy solutions and advanced energy services the y-axis um, and we use this as a visual to look at who's doing what 
and some some of these activities are already commercially implemented so let's use tesla as an example uh, in some markets they have relationships with third parties uh, to provide domestic charge points in some markets they have their own so you can buy tesla branded charge point for your house they've obviously invested in public charging uh, everyone's aware of the supercharger network uh, which was initially a very capex heavy thing to do uh, but but it has been seen as a sticky service it is something that customers of tesla value a lot uh, they know it'll work they know it's available it's integrated well into their car uh, and it's seen as tesla trying to do something for their customers which will drive repeat business back to them uh, and that's that's a very a very powerful um, position to be in as an automaker uh, but they're also not just doing the charging they're also doing domestic energy solutions uh, they've got uh, a supply license for the UK now. Uh, they've been supplying in the US. They've got uh, the power wall uh, uh, for domestic battery storage. They've also got the power pack for commercial uh, battery storage. Uh, they integrate with renewables. They have a subsidiary called Solar City, uh, and they're doing the whole home energy management solution, which is all through the same Tesla app, which uh, is quite well integrated and works really well. Um, on the advanced energy services side. Um, we think that their vehicles are capable of vehicle to X, and I'm not using vehicle to grid or vehicle to home because fundamentally it's the same concept. It's discharging the battery through the charge point. Whether you're using it to do grid services or for the home, it's a different use case. So we're going to use vehicle to X for this. Uh, it's expected to come as a as a feature on on Tesla vehicles. It wouldn't it wouldn't be uh, surprising to not. I mean, it would be surprising to not have it. Uh, and and we've classified and I'll I'll get it. we've classified Tesla as one of the market leaders because they were first to market. They've got the biggest breadth across um, you know the different areas that we're looking at, as you can see from this. Uh, and uh, they are the brand that's most closely associated with electrification today. So um, this is quite a fast-moving area. Abisha, if we were to do this table again in three months, would it change significantly, do you think? Or um, how, how dynamic is this if you look back at the last year and you look forward to the next next year? You've got a few expected uh, circles there. Yeah, I've got a few expected circles there. And it will change. I, I expect some of the expected to go on to you know, the trial or pilot stage. Yeah. And some to go into commercially implemented. What, uh, as an example of how fast moving it is, uh, since I made this table, uh, we've had announcements from uh, four of the OEM groups on this table announcing uh, new partnerships and new acquisitions and new investments. Uh, yeah. So, so it's it's a very fast moving um, space. And this, I think, this table was only made maybe two weeks ago. So, it's things are moving quite quickly, uh, yeah. which which means it's a it's an effort to keep this up to date now. But you know, uh, it's uh, it it shows the the rate of progress and the rate of um, so the diversification of some of the OEM groups into what, what they can and can't do. Okay. Um, um, what I suggest we do now, just keeping an eye on time, is to, yeah. to move on to the next slide. And yeah. just a reminder, this uh, a lot of this material is from a white paper we've published, which is available uh, on our website. So uh, let's have a look at the the come back to that matrix, Savashek, and yep. you've got the logos now in those circles. We've got the logos. So, so we've used we've um, used the. Uh, sorry, you were saying something, John? Uh, no, you carry on, Savashek. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so we were using so we're using the the table above and uh, to to fill in you know where where people fit which where the OEMs fit in to this uh, to this matrix in essence and um, as you can see there's. We've mentioned Tesla already, but we've got Nissan and Renault, who are probably the closest in terms of doing uh, of doing projects and doing activities in the e-mobility space and the electrification space beyond the car. Mm -hmm. um, the Leaf and Zoe have been a success for them, as well as the ENV 200 uh, and whatever else they launch next. Um, and of course, they are also, you know, they're, they're, they have products like the X Storage and they have vehicle to grid working on their vehicles and they're the most prolific you know proponents of vehicle grid at the moment because their vehicles do it um, you've then got um, the geely group for example uh, we don't we cannot buy a geely branded vehicle in europe today uh, but their brands volvo polestar levc uh, lotus 
you can and they are they're expanding quickly they've got strategic partnerships through each brand with different different aspects of the energy ecosystem and i expect them to be trialing um, some services with some of their brands and seeing what fits best for which brand um, okay. you've then got volkswagen who's uh, who've launched the ellie group i think we have some um, some attendees from ellie as well um, and underneath that there's going to be a whole lot of electricity based product and service that you can buy alongside your vehicle and that's across the volkswagen group now we've then got the fast followers i'm, I'm not going to go into each one but um ford is in the fast followers group because they've just launched their first electric vehicle but they've also invested in ionity so for those who don't know ionity is a you know is a joint venture between a number of the big oems and the energy space and some strategic suppliers and partners to put in a fast charging network across europe um we can't put that we can't put ionity as an oem on this on this image however uh because it's got so much investment from the oems it's important to bring up um ford have invested in that they're thinking ahead that their customers will want a public charging solution that they can access and uh, that's why ford are mainly in house at the moment there's going to be a ford branded charge point domestic charge point there's going to be a ford invested public charging um, ecosystem and probably more we don't know yet um, but you know the, as an example ford one of the biggest oems should be moving up slightly into the challenges section over time going back to a question john asked me earlier uh, and then we've got opportunities with the others so psa and fca they're early in their electrification journey uh, once they merge it opens up a whole bunch of opportunities for them they're quite similar in their strategy currently uh, and then uh, and then we've got hyundai kia who are so i was surprised to see them in the fast followers i thought they would have been further ahead uh, because of you know what their brands are they're, they're they're quite intelligent companies they're quite cool brands as well uh, and i would expect them to be trialing some of the other value-added services for customers so abhishek it's if we draw this again and i think it's something we will keep up to date and well we will update then we'll expect to see from what you're saying some movement within this you've yeah. uh, alluded to some of the uh, movement that we might see in the next months and, and year um, by doing this, we also put our neck on the line a little bit, and it would be interesting yeah. to hear from people that have uh, different views or are surprised by some of the positioning here, uh, either in the, the comments box or questions box or through uh, talking with us afterwards. We'd be delighted to talk with you if you've got some, uh, some differing views or different perspectives on this. Mm -hmm. Alex, I'd like to bring you in at this point because we could draw a similar two by two for utilities or energy companies, couldn't we? Uh, maybe the only difference would be focus on vehicle production. They don't make the vehicle themselves. So can you just give us perspective? If we look, think about that battle for the customer uh, that you we talked about at the very beginning, how might this look for energy companies or utilities or uh, would the access be different or where would they be clustered? Yeah, whilst Abhishek was talking there, I was kind of envisaging where we could put some utility bubbles onto this uh, two by two. And broadly, I think for European utilities, we can put a nice big bubble on top of the fast followers for uh, OEMs. So we, we generally see that uh, utilities have been more advanced in investing and integrating a lot of e-mobility products and services um, because it's seen as quite core to the future of, of energy retail in the in the coming decade um, i would say most utilities uh, you know from very small ones to the multinationals would be in the middle left of this graph today mm. um, but the push is to move further towards the right um, however you can to move perhaps more away from the partnerships more to internalizing your um, your investments okay uh, so we're looking mainly today at the oem sector but i think important to keep in mind that it's not just oems going after these opportunities but it's quite a battle and we'll pick that up uh, in a little bit uh, let's keep moving through the 
the slides. Lots of questions coming in, which is great. Please keep them coming and we'll, we'll pick up ones that we can uh, during the webinar today and come back to you on ones that we don't get to. So um, I guess this slide, Abhishek, really just uh, brings together some of the those different groupings that we see. And on the right hand side, um, bringing out some of those differences between in-house and partnering. Um, how many, Abhishek, do you see sort of seeing this as core in-house capability and how many do you see actually they've got so many challenges in their industry at the moment that they're going to partner to develop these energy energy capabilities? Uh, I think from an OEM perspective, I mean, there's no general right or wrong answer to, you know, what's the best approach you should take uh, as an OEM. It's entirely dependent on your 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 challenges that you're facing, the opportunities that you have, and uh, and what you can what you can feasibly do. Um, mm -hmm. So, in house gives you the opportunity of you know you have a degree of control. You can m manage what you put out there. Uh, you you are the f you are the face of it. It's also your brand on the product that's going out alongside your car, uh, which is which opens up more revenue streams as well for the OEMs, uh, which is never a bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does come with a riskier approach of are you doing the right thing, which which is maybe not the most flexible position to be in. Um, if you are now doing joint venturing or partnerships, it means you can always work with the best opportunity that you've got yeah. uh, for a certain amount of time. And it may work better for some of the OEMs who want to give the market, you know, the open market, the free choice. Uh, because as you know, as, as you alluded to, it's not just the OEMs who are looking at providing um, e-mobility solutions. It's also the energy uh, space, the utility space, and the specialists who are, um, you know, who are coming to market now, uh, who are looking at providing just those services. They may be better at some aspects than the OEMs, and the OEMs may be better at some aspects than the others. Uh, so it, it it entirely depends on what strategy that they've got and they can uh, execute on. Okay, uh, let's move to question three of the, the yeah. third question that we set out at the beginning of the, the webinar. So of the different approaches we've looked at, what is the right approach? And um, of course, there there isn't a single right approach. It depends very much on a company's strategy, risk appetite, and ambition. Um, Abhishek, talk us through this slide. Yeah. So, uh, as you mentioned, it's risk appetite and ambition, and it's and it's what can you do with the the capital you might have. So, I mean, there's a few target opportunities for the OEMs that they could be uh, they could be focused they should be focusing on uh, if they want to play more of a part in the you know, in the e mobility space beyond the car. Um, there's integration with the domestic energy system. Now, it's it's become clear that as soon as customers switch to an electric vehicle, they become much more aware of their domestic consumption, uh, what their electricity bill is, how much they're paying per kilowatt hour. It's not something you'd really focus on more than once a year when you're changing, uh, you know, when you're changing contract. Uh, we, from our research as well, we've seen I think close to 70% of people who buy an EV look at changing tariff, and 40% of them do because they bought an EV. So there's definitely integration there. Uh, and there's also lots of smart solutions. Um, the other bit is the ease of access, which is almost seen as the basic thing that you need to provide alongside your EV, uh, which is charging at home and in public. And as we've mentioned, there's two ways to do it. There's facilitation by third parties and partnerships, or it's providing your own wall box. Uh, and we've seen different approaches to this. There's there are companies who will provide their own wall box for free um, with each car that they sell. There are some that will even do the installation for you for free, and some that will only recommend you to go to someone else um, to get your wall box. Uh, it it fits some approaches fit better. Obviously, a free domestic charge point is more appealing to a customer. Uh, so that there's there are ways that you know an OEM could look at the ease of access uh, charging perspective mm -hmm. uh, to optimize for themselves. And there's the smart solutions that I mentioned. Uh, it's working with all of the other bits in your house. It's the interoperability bit. And very much up here, I think the, the complex integration with the electricity system. So helping to smooth those peaks or opportunities to provide balancing services to the electricity system. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
and then uh, and then there is there is a really complex <laughs> energy solutions which is integrating with your solar and your domestic storage and taking full advantage of smart tariffs and dynamic tariffs uh, some OEMs are doing this with partnerships with other uh, with other you know electri electrification uh, sorry electricity specialists almost um, it is a big opportunity um, it also allows customers the option to charge their car at a rate they'd like which is important as choice um, and then it's in interoperability, interoperability with all of this and integrating everything that uh, a customer might have um, we already have people with smart houses today with uh, all the devices talking to each other uh, we have seen some some charge point manufacturers also working with some of these platforms to integrate so that it can all be managed together from one place um, and I think that's going to be quite an important aspect going forward. Okay, and then on the right hand side, we, we've identified some of the skills and investments and capabilities that are required to capture these opportunities. And it's only a selection, but I think it gives a nice indication of the the newness of this area for OEMs and yeah. Abhishek we've chatted about this you worked for an OEM and your job was to do all of this so uh, it's there's a lot of uh, those people from OEMs on the line at the moment will know how much change and challenge there is in the OEM sector at the moment with electrification with uh, shared with autonomous driving with connectivity in in uh, in cars so this is another whole area on top of all of that. So um, yeah. not, an, not an easy life being an OEM at the moment, Abhishek. Uh, no, it's not. And, it's, and a lot of the skill sets that we've got on this, on this page uh, won't already exist within an OEM. Mm. Uh, so that makes it even harder for some of the OEMs to actually pivot and repurpose maybe the very skilled engineers and team you know the teams uh, who are focused on vehicles today to come and do something else uh, it's um, quite a challenge yeah we've got one more slide before the poll and moving on yes. to some questions so yeah the as we said earlier there's not a right or a wrong there are good reasons why you might be a leader good reasons why you might be a challenger and good reasons why you might be a fast follower um, so this slide will look at uh, some of the key considerations about what bucket you want to be in and some of the risks and rewards. Yeah, I mean, there are some there are some opportunities around integration of the wider energy ecosystem. Um, there are revenue opportunities. There are product and service opportunities to provide to the customer, um, which could which would also make your vehicle more appealing uh, because it fits in quite well. Um, the other thing that an OEM should be considering is if you if you are able to provide the overall energy ecosystem for a customer, um, they're less likely to swap out of your brand uh, because you're less likely to change your domestic appliances than you are with your car. Uh, the other big you know the big prize for all of these opportunities to, to harness let's say revenue streams from domestic storage, from uh, smart charging, from vehicle to X, um, etc. You some of it requires a lot of capex, um, but but the revenue streams are not insignificant. Uh, they are new; they're not core to the OEM's current business, but they will provide more reward than uh, not doing. So the cost of not doing is there, um, but they obviously require some you know new energy expertise and capex to make it happen. Um, Partnering is a pragmatic approach to the solution. Uh, the market is evolving every day. Uh, there are specialists, uh, specialist e-mobility companies out there that are doing some very smart, innovative things today, and they're launching almost every week. Uh, so if you partner, uh, you will probably get the best thing that you've got available uh, for the customer to provide that as a solution. But the quality of your partners will obviously affect your brand. I'm sure OEMs don't need a lesson in brand management, uh, but the, the partnerships that they go into uh, and the service that's provided it will be very important and uh, I guess whoever owns the customer so the vehicle is most likely currently to be bought either through a retailer and we're seeing more of the online sales as well uh, 
but that means you've got it's your face in front of the customer so you sell the vehicle but also anything else around it and as we've seen from our customer research and also on the first slide the the customer is looking to the oem to to suggest the solution whether it's provide the charging solution or suggest anything else because they're buying the most the second most expensive thing they're going to buy uh, from a vehicle oem a car uh, everything that fits around the car and integrates with the car they would look to the person who makes the car to suggest as well um, so it's quite powerful to have that to be in that position and leveraging that is quite useful for uh, an oem and uh, you know uh, not every oem will do exactly the same thing there's no oem that is going to do um, everything uh, exactly the same as somebody else uh, but different strategies can help and they can be tailored to create new revenue streams you might you might choose to focus only on providing um, domestic and public charge points and let everything else be done by the open market uh, if that's your strategy that works to enable that uh, and it could also go the other way thanks Abhishek so on the right hand slide uh, we've mm -hmm. got a risk reward chart and um, Unsurprisingly, the leaders are in the, the top right here, yeah. so um, biggest reward but biggest risk. And unsurprisingly, yeah. we've put the challenges uh, diagonally below them. Yeah. Fast followers, though, we've got slightly offset because there's less reward probably, but we think there's still quite significant risk. And that relates to Abhishek's point number four on the left, that uh, if they're focusing more on the car itself and less on the added value services, they may find customers buying those added value services from others. And if in the future we see people buying cars in different ways, maybe online, as Abhishek said, or from e-mobility providers or a subscription, then there's a risk that a vehicle manufacturer could be commoditized behind these people that own the, or own more of the customer relationship. So we see slightly more risk with being a, a fast follower than you might expect. So not a simple straight line on that graph. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I promised a poll. So let's move on to the, the poll and um, a simplistic question, because I know it's not as, uh, as simple as which one is going to win, but a useful way to feel the mood of everyone on the, the webinar today. So, uh, if we launch the poll, your answers are confidential. So feel free to pick which answer you feel uh, best fits the question, uh, win the battle for the e-mobility customer. We're focused on the OEMs, the three groups that you see here. Uh, it could be a, we lumped energy, oil and gas and utility together. So whether it's a, a Total, a Shell, an Eon, an EDF, and the new specialists are the whole new breed of companies that are offering maybe EVs on subscription packaged with charging and charging services. Uh, there's a really exciting breed of companies that are emerging uh, around uh, new mobility solutions. So give you a few more seconds to vote and Abhishek, do you want to close the poll and share the results? And let's see what uh, we've yeah. got. Well, people are still voting, so let's give it another oh, few okay. seconds. Uh, yeah, it's it's where it. Yeah, people need the explanation, or we're making people think. No, I think we're making people think, which is good. <laughs> it's quite close, I must say, uh, for some of the answers. Yeah. Right, let's um, uh, let's close the let's close the poll. And whoop, it's uh can you still see my slides? Uh, we can see the slide, but not the uh, poll result. Ah, uh, you can just click the share button, Abhishek. Yeah, I'll do that here. Yeah. Here we yeah. go. Um, so really interesting diversity. Uh, we were just talking before the webinar about whether actually fast followers should have been in there, and only 7% of people think fast followers will, uh, will, will catch up. Although sometimes it's nice not to be on the leading edge or even the bleeding edge. Mm -hmm. um, one comment coming in that uh, being a fast follower in a relationship is usually not great which yes. I, I i concur with but there is time still to catch up um but yeah i guess two-thirds approximately just under two-thirds thinking oem market leader or challenges 
yep. will win. Uh, but just over two thirds betting on energy and new specialists. Mm -hmm. uh, so very interesting and I think shows how open uh, and dynamic and uncertain the market still is. Absolutely. Um, okay, thanks very much for participating in that. We'll put the poll results in the slides and send them to you afterwards. We had one yeah. question, do do we say who's on the call? And no, we, we keep that confidential, so we don't share a list of who's on the call today. Uh, but we've got a, a really good cross-section of people from OEM and energy and related sectors uh, yeah. across Europe. Um, Abhishek, if we can bring the slides back up. Um, yeah. What I'm going to ask Alex to do now is uh, just a very quick uh, flash up some slides on our uh, research service that today's webinar has pulled on. It's a little bit of a quid pro quo that we've we've shared some of our insight and Alex is just going to share quickly where this comes from and then we'll pick up a couple of the questions. Um, over to you Alex. Great, thanks John. So yeah, all of our insights come from uh, our EVs and electricity team. You can see uh, a few of us there on the on the screen, and we've built over the last few years a um, a team of who've got experience across um, the OEM side, like Abhishek, with some uh, utility and consulting and um, and sustainability backgrounds to to bring a lot of overview to what is happening happening in e mobility. Um, the way that we've structured this service is to try and make it as a as a gateway to all things in uh, European e-mobility, and we cut this through different particular pillars. We do a lot on what's happening in the home, what's happening with public charging business models, how are fleets electrifying, and of course, how do we make things smart and integrated into the into the energy system? And crucially, we are responding to our customer questions and you can see suggestions of what what they are around the sides of that slide. Alex on the what's the while you've got fleet up there we've got a great question uh, come in so uh, we've said that the customer is looking to the OEM now of course that's more the case in the B2C market and uh, we all know that the fleet market is incredibly important for new sales and it's where mm. So therefore very important for EV sales today. Um, Alex, for fleets, would you say that the customer is looking to the OEM or I guess it's a bit more complex than that with fleets, with lease companies and a whole a wider range of companies? Yes, and the, a lot of what we do with our clients is help define what we mean by fleet. Uh, there's lots of different uh, areas there. We're not just talking about the, the delivery vans that we're seeing a lot of in lockdown. We're looking at company cars and a lot of that comes down to, yes, a lot of how um, leasing companies are um, adjusting what they offer to fleet managers and those responsible for, for company car policies. Increasingly, there's some really interesting mobility and even smart energy propositions coming from those those leasing companies too. Mm. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, and, and to add to that, John, uh, for OEMs, the fleet market uh, is quite an important segment. It can it can count as quite a large percentage of the actual annual sales or you know registrations of the vehicles. Uh, large fleets will probably go directly to the OEM in some mm. cases. Mm. Uh, and and we we look at leasing companies, but they are in essence a fleet that they're buying from the OEM to then resell. So I think that's bringing out the case that the the B two C and the, the the fleet market are, are very different. So our yes, simplistic absolutely. question that we ask is even more complex when you look at the different parts of the market. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I pull out one yeah. other question here while we're uh, yeah. so we've had a couple of questions about China and India, and while we focus on Europe, um, Alex and Abhishek, any perspective on OEMs in India and China and uh, I guess where they'd fit on our matrix or are they more active or less active than we see OEMs in Europe? Uh, yeah, I can, I can try that. Um, the, the, so the Chinese market is, is, is a little bit further ahead in terms of the, the vehicle side and the technology side for uh, the vehicles. Uh, they are obviously moving into Europe, uh, Geely is an example, uh, by 
either acquisition of brands or investments, um, but they will also bring their own brand vehicles to uh, Europe in the near future. Uh, from India, the, the market is slightly different. It is the electrification market for India is expected to be the two and three wheeler segment to start with. That'll be the volume. Um, there will be four wheeler passenger cars, definitely. I mean, Tata's already launched some, Mahindra has launched some as well in India. Um, some of that may have been developed in Europe as well and then taken back uh, to India. Uh, so Abhishek, can I just interrupt you? We can see your whole screen, not the presentation mode, so we can oh. see your, your notes. Uh, you Interesting. Thanks for the comment. Uh, 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 let's to that. Uh, has that. Has that fixed it? No, uh, I don't that's so. no normal slide mode. Okay, uh, let, me, uh, let me just restart that. But uh, uh, we can take another question while I figure out what I've done. Okay, uh, Alex, I'll pick one for you. Um, let me just scroll through them. We had a just, question just, come. Sorry, go on, Alex. Sorry, just on on talking about China. Um, what we are seeing is a lot of the uh, the EV charging suppliers in in China looking to um, export their their models, um, particularly across to, to to North America, but also to uh, the uh, to, to European markets as well. So we're expecting to see more offices launching in Germany, looking to bring their um, their models, their their, their charge points. Um, into into Europe, it's already a very crowded uh, market, um, but that's their intention. Thanks. And Abhishek, that slide's fixed now, so thanks for that. Um, Fantastic. Keeping our time, we're, we're running out of time. It's 10.43 here in the UK. So I think we'll uh, wrap up, just got this last slide with our upcoming and recent deliverables under our, our research service. Uh, obviously, we'd love to hear from you if you're interested, if you've got comments, if you'd like to suggest areas we should focus on. We've had some really useful comments and questions come in during the webinar. One or two things for us to look at in terms of our uh, our table. I did, I did say it was fast moving and dynamic, uh, so thanks for that. And a number of questions we didn't have time to cover today, so we'll get back to everyone individually. Um, Please let us know if you'd like the slides and recording. We'll um, send out a, a note for you to request that. And thanks very much for your, your time and attention today. It's a fascinating area, a fast moving area. Uh, we'll keep doing our best to uh, produce research and analysis that helps everyone make the, the best informed decisions and move forward in the best way. And we'll keep you in touch with our our research and share more highlights uh, in the next months ahead. Alex and Abhishek, thank you very much to you for, for sharing the insights and um, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks for your time. We hope it was useful for you and look forward to being in touch soon. Yep, likewise, thank you very much for joining everyone. Thank you very much. Right, and I'll end it here. Thank you. Thanks everyone and goodbye. Yeah.